so um, my name my name is Dominic, um, and today I want to take you through this uh, this early childhood, um, the physical, the cognitive, and emotional. I'll be just a brief, okay? Um, I am a I'm a psychologist and lecturer at Sangaza University College, and uh, I want to take you through a crash course. I would say on early childhood and what happens in early childhood and what needs to be like. I just want you to know the psychology behind it. And possibly you can use a little bit of what I will say, you know, to help you uh, in your own work as a parent, as I'm using the word you in your own work as a parent, okay? So I will highlight a few things, key things, it's not so much, okay? We don't have time for a lot of in-depth psychology, but more of a crash course. And then from there you can pick it up and say, okay, um, what can I use to understand my child better and to parent my child better, okay? So that's, that's my intention. All right, so early childhood. So early childhood in psychology is between the age of two to six, okay? After that is called middle childhood. And then when your child starts uh, maybe menstruation or uh, a sperma key for boys or white dream as we call it, then that's what you call now adolescence, okay? So we have infanthood up to two years, then early childhood. So two to six years. And I think a majority of your children uh, are in this age, in this age. Uh -huh. So there is a rapid growth here in cognitive and language use at this point. That means their intellect, their thinking is developing. Of course, it's not very nuanced. Uh? It's not very, very nuanced, but it is growing and language is developing. Now, at this point, especially in language, I would like to say something. Uh? Language develops when children are, you know, here, here you saying something. So take, for example, if a child makes a mistake and you say, Stop doing that, you well, jingas, watch out. Huh? You have not given them a language to understand why they were doing something wrong. Now, remember this. Whereas the brain, the brain, a brain is hardware. Huh? The brain is hardware. The mind is a software. Okay? Brain is hardware, mind is software. The hardware finishes growing around the age of eight, eight years, the hardware. The software needs 24 years. Okay, 24 years. And that means children up to the age of even college students do not have a complete mind or complete brain, if you want to say. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you are feeding them as you speak to them. And they are going to use the language they hear from you huh? to, to think, to think. Mm -hmm. So, and then here there's also increased peer influence, what they see their friends doing. And uh, around by six years, the brain is 95% uh, of its total adult weight. The, the brain, not the mind, the hardware, not the software. Huh? And so it is important to understand. And uh, in fact, in relation to media, in relation to media, if you want to read, you can go to um, American Association of Pediatrician.org. Mm -hmm. American Association of Pediatricians.org. They have media guidelines 2016 on how much exposure children need to a screen according to their age, age group, okay, or age, uh, where the, the, age, the age they are in. And you will see that in that, in that guidelines, and this for the, for the whole of the, of the country and all, all over the world anyway, according to the developmental stages of each child, they will say for a child between zero to two years, they should have zero media zero media, zero screen. Huh? So imagine how many of us put our children in front of a, of a screen so that we're able to, to do a, a few more activities here and there. It's not good for their brain. It's not good for their development. It's not good for their language development. And then they say between the ages of three and six, not more than one hour. Ah, now let's think about that again. Huh? So, and then after seven, eight years, I said, you know, now focus more now on content. What content are they consuming? And still not too much because we know today very well within psychological research that there's a strong relationship between depression, anxiety in adolescents and they are, how much time they are, they're staying on social media. We know their attention deficit is being affected by how much they're spending on social media, okay? So uh, again, to, to, to understand those dynamics. Now, one of the biggest thing that uh, the brain needs is sleep. 
Sleep is so important that psychologists, we don't know what to do to impress on people that they need to sleep. You know, we live in a, in a world where uh, you are supposed to, you know, the more you sleep, you are seen as lazy, but your brain needs it. Huh? Your brain needs it. And you can see here on your screen how much per age people are required to sleep. And this is, this is not, uh, you know, uh, just something that has, you know, people are suggesting. No, this is research. This, this is grounded. There's a whole sleep foundation that does research on the importance of sleep. Uh, and as you can see here, newborn, zero to three months. So the, the deep blue or dark blue, if you, I don't know, just the blue one, that is the recommended. The sky blue is what it may be appropriate if you cannot meet it, okay? Then the other ones, I don't know if we, let's call it brown for the purpose of time, uh, because I don't know these colors. It is not recommended at all, you know? And I want you to see where your children are. So here it is between three and five years, I bet. So tod between toddler and preschool, it is 11 to 14, 10 to 13 hours, okay? So if your, if your child is between three to five, the minimum hours, minimum hours they should be sleeping is eight. They can go all the way to 14, that's still okay. More than that is not good for your health, you know, and below that's also not good for your health, and especially the growth of your brain, okay? Now, what happens when children do not sleep? I was speaking yesterday about teenagers, and it, it affects across all ages. There is a problem with obesity. There's a problem with attention. The, their stress and anxiety increases, okay? And you know very well, like, a lot of stress is related to your child bedwetting, you know? So uh, you want to pay attention to all those details, huh? So is my child sleeping enough? And what that means is it's very, very possible. It's very, very important for you maybe to ask your child that during the week, the, the, the weekday, not acknowledge. Might be upset about it, but no. Unless it's absolutely necessary, during weekday, you play your books, interact with your siblings, not acknowledge. Huh? So that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's very important. They might get irritated, but they need it. Huh? They will need it. So. This is very important. Now I want you even to see if you have a teenager. Minimum seven hours. Huh? Sometimes when, when, when our Ministry of Education is getting surprised why our students are striking, huh? it's here. Because we know that lack of sleep is, uh, is related to low self-control across all ages, across all ages. Huh? So are you sleeping enough? And uh, are we allowing our children to sleep enough? And you yourself, I'm sure a good number of you are here, adult, between seven and, you know, adult years, seven and nine, minimum six, maximum 10. Again, I would just like to mention here, sleep is strongly genetic, meaning uh, if you're in your family tree, in your family tree, people are not heavy sleepers, you may be doing well with five, six hours. Yeah, and that's, you, that you, can, you can know that by looking at your family tree, okay? But if you're in your family tree, people are heavy sleepers, then there's a very good chance you need eight hours so for you to operate properly. And you need to give your body that because it is biology. There's nothing you can do about that really much. Huh? So, and, and also interestingly, by, you know, intel, you know, IQ is strongly, strongly biological, right? meaning children inherit their IQ. Okay, so now theory of mind. There's something that we call theory of mind. And it's very, very important I want to, to say here. So theory of mind is understanding that the mind holds people's beliefs, desires, emotional intentions. Basically what that means is this. By the age of four, children's theory of mind allows them to understand that people think differently and may have different preferences and may mask their true feelings. Now, theory of mind basically is the opposite of, I don't know if you've ever seen this with young children. So let's take, for example, you are with your two-year-old uh, and you're watching TV. And uh, you are, so you're sitting on the chair watching TV. And then your two-year-old runs and say, hey, dad, or hey, mom, and comes and stands right in front of you, in front of the, like, in the direction you're watching TV. And you can't watch, see TV, the, you know, you can't see the TV because the child is right in front of you. And then you tell your child, hey, move, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching that, okay. The thing is this. Children think if they can see something, even if you're behind them, you can see. They don't know that simply because they can see something, right? You are behind them, you cannot see. They don't know, they can't process that, okay? 
And after some time, they start, they, they start now developing what you call theory of mind. Oh, just because I can see does not mean I can see. If you ask a child, a two-year-old, maybe who is looking at a picture, show me the picture that you are seeing. You know, maybe the child is looking at the picture like this. Show me the picture you're seeing. Or maybe you're this side. Huh? The child will just maybe simply extend the image without turning it around. Meaning, why? Because I can see you should be able to see. Hmm? Now, as they develop theory of mind, they start realizing, no, I need to turn the picture so that the other people can see. Now, this helps develop children. This helps to develop children to develop. Uh, sorry for that. Yeah? This helps children to develop self-awareness and the ability to anticipate the needs of others. The reason I'm introducing this theory of mind is not all children develop theory of mind. See? Not all children develop theory of mind. Uh, there is those who call who develop autism. Okay, autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. So those on the autism spectrum typically show an impaired ability to recognize other people's mind. You have children who can't tell when someone is happy and be happy with them. They can't tell when someone is angry. So you're angry with them and they can't tell. Majority of them are boys. Huh? They can't tell, right? And uh, it is characterized by, autism is characterized by deficits in social communication, right? and interaction across multiple contexts, as well as restrictive behaviors and interests. I'm gonna give you a, a few examples. So children with autism, when it comes to communication, they don't know how to start or maintain a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they communicate with gestures instead of words. They just point, they just point. Mm -hmm. They repeat words, they keep repeat words or memorized passages. They keep repeating the same words over and over again. It's not, it's not in a very robotic manner, but they just keep using, yeah, sometimes they can do that in a very robotic manner. When it comes to, to playing, they, they don't play interactive games. That means they don't like to play with other children. They like to play by themselves alone, okay? And they avoid eye contact with other children, with adults, and they display lack of empathy. They can, they can laugh in very odd times and they don't know how to sympathize with someone who is suffering. Uh, so that's a good a good uh, example. Then uh, when it comes to the sensory, they might find normal noises painful. So you 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 put on the the radio or TV loud, and they find it very very uncomfortable. And they might hold hands over their ears, and then they withdraw from physical contact when someone wants to touch them. Huh? Or they and they try to they go they rub surfaces, you know, or they lick uh, objects. Okay. They keep doing this with their hands. Huh? And then when they are playing, they don't imitate the actions of others. Mm? They don't imitate the actions of others. And as I mentioned, they prefer solitary or ritualistic play. And behaviors, they have, sometimes can have very, very intense tantrums. Huh? And short attention span at times, and very narrow interest. They only may be interested in trains. They only interested in cars. They are not interested in a particular activity. Okay, so now what, what you need to do is to observe these and maybe refer to a clinical psychologist for, bed, for a thorough diagnosis, huh? if, you, if you see some of these things. As I mentioned, there are more boys who are affected by autism than girls, but there are also a few, but more of them usually are boys. Okay, so uh, there is an increase in autism. One of the biggest culprits of autism is... Um, cigarette smoking on the part of the mother or being around uh, cigarette smoke. So that, that seems to, 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 to relate uh, among, among, the, among also genetic, you know, in the family tree. So there is increase, even though this is uh, reflective of a US context, it seems to reflect around the world, okay? So uh, autism, facts, you know, that every parent should know, you know, that autistic children generally have exceptional visual, academic, and music skills. So the thing about autistic, autistic children is they can be very, very smart. If you ever watched, watched a series, there's a series on Netflix, if you ever watched, if you watch Netflix, it's called uh, Big Bang Theory, Big Bang Theory. And one of the main characters, Sheldon Cooper, uh, is now an example of someone with autism, okay? So it's a, it's a comedy, of course. It's a comedy, but it, you, you, that's a very, very good example. Hmm? So autism is found to be less in children whose mothers took prenatal vitamins during pregnancy. Okay, so when 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 the when the mother was pregnant, 
the, they took you know vitamins okay uh, that um, that seems to be to, to help to reduce autism okay and the average diagnosis is about three and a half years okay so children with autism have uh, communication abilities okay uh, it is 25 15 percent of cases are of genetic disorder autism recurrence rates in families okay 20 percent and uh, 40 percent of autistic children have intellectual disability so you will want to observe this what you can help it's a very it's you can be able to accompany your child better okay very good now moving from that i will take questions as i go i want to, to try to first of all go finish as much as i can now there is uh, there is uh, a psychologist called Lev Vygotsky, uh, yeah, a Russian psychologist, who introduced the whole idea of zone of proximal development, and basically he says this: when you are educating a child, so that the learning does not become stressful and anxiety provoking, you don't teach the child, you don't take the child from what they can do to what they can't do. You take the child first to what they can do with assistance. Okay, and that's very, very important. Because when you teach a child something that is completely new from what they know you knew previously, the learning becomes stressful. And stress is not good for children. Because children who start becoming stressed at a very young age become hypersensitive to stress for their lifespan. And that is not good. You know, you find children who are 13 or 15, or you find people who are in their 20s. And they cry very easily at the slightest of stress. They become easily overwhelmed. Huh? So it's maybe because they were exposed to high levels of stress when they were young. Now, this is what we mean. It's very, very important for teachers and even for parents. When you are educating a child, don't take them too far away from what they already know. Okay? So that they can, they can, they can make connections. As you can see, they can make a connection between what they can do independently. That's called zone of achieved development uh, and what they can't do. Uh, so there is a connection by what they can do with assistance. And that's, it. that's where the instruction should happen. Okay, so language development continued. So he says, this uh, psychologist, Levy Gotsky, he believed private speech, today we call it private speech. Well, Dominic, Native private speech. Mm -hmm. It seeks to solve problems or clarify thoughts. It starts with spoken. You can see children speaking to themselves when they are doing something, and that's okay. Okay, unless it's very, very obsessive, then you can maybe can it could be mimic autism. But don't don't get shocked. It's a private speech, and they and they use that to clarify thoughts. Over time, it becomes internal. Okay, all of us sometimes when we are thinking, we think internally. But children, they don't know yet how to think internally, to have that speech within themselves, okay? They speak it out. Even if they are by themselves, they are speaking. No, they are trying to clarify, to solve a problem or to clarify a thought, okay? So don't, don't, hey, they're just trying to clarify a thought, all right? So, so don't, don't, uh, don't punish them for what you call now private speech, okay? So, now, this usually is a problem. Children from less advantaged backgrounds are exposed to millions fewer words in their first three years than those from higher socioeconomic groups. And, and usually that's, that's the thing, eh? because socioeconomic status of also oftentimes influences the IQ of children because nutrition is strongly related to IQ. Also, there's biology, but also there's nutrition. And if children are not feeding properly, then they will, their IQ does not develop as well. If they're not hearing words around them properly, uh, uh, then they don't have software to think because the language they hear helps them to think. Now you can see here, children from disadvantaged backgrounds have way fewer words. That means they have less software to think with. Okay, and that is, that is that you, th there is an impact on that. So maybe a certain level of justice is required as far as I can tell. So developing self-concept. Um, self-concept, what is self-concept? Is the idea of who I am, what I am capable of doing, and how I think and how I feel. Uh, children are developing self-concept already. Now, self-concept develops throughout the lifetime. Okay, it develops throughout the lifetime. Right, now, uh, 
how does it start? Okay, so there are two parts of the self for all of us. There is the I, you know, which is spontaneous, which is creative, which is innate, and it's not really concerned about how others view us. But then there is the me, or a social definition of who we are, or what we call the socialized self. It's a very, very important social self. The socialized self begins when a child is able to consider how one important person views them. Okay, what does that mean? When the child knows my father loves me, okay, my mother loves me, and I hear it, the child starts to develop a sense of self-concept. But if the child is not hearing words of comfort, words of appreciation, words of significance, then the child does not know, okay? And, and, uh, and this way, sometimes often they get clingy to someone who is wrong, the wrong person, okay? So can the child say, my father loves me? Whether or not I am very well behaved, whether or not I'm, I'm academically, I'm doing very well academically, my parent loves me. Because there needs to be one person, one significant person in the life of the child who makes them view themselves as valuable, who makes them feel self-confident, who makes them feel like, you know, they can develop better, you know? They need to experience, to hear those words. And if they don't hear those words, they might hear those words elsewhere. They might come across as less confident. They might feel maybe their colleagues are better than them. They might come across, uh, they might actually be performing poorly because they don't believe uh, in themselves properly, okay? So that's very important. Now, let me see, uh, just a quick pause, five minute pause here and see what uh, questions or comments are there so that they don't get too many. Uh, so, Mm -hmm. I'm not very sure because there's some there's a lot of questions to the teachers, so I think it is around ten. Thank you, Dominic, on the issue of sleeping. Do daycare sleep at schools, so we can know if they are to sleep once we receive them from school? So I guess that's a response that you will get from the teachers. So I hope the uh, sister Wilma and team have noted that they can respond to that later. Uh, for the kids with asthma, okay, that's a different question. That's for the school. Mm, again, what kid? about what kids are defiling others. I guess that's a sort of school question. Okay, so there's a question here. Uh, how, how do I help my five-year-old gain confidence and boost their self-esteem? Okay, so uh, by the way, if you have a question and you don't want maybe like to expose your child, you can, you can direct message on uh, PAC. You know, I'm, I'm using the account with the, which, is, which has the acronym of PPAK, it's Positive Psychology Association of Kenya. Huh? So you can direct message me or DM me and then I respond. So someone asked, I'm not gonna read out the name, how do I help my five-year-old gain confidence and boost their self-esteem? So one, the biggest part, the biggest part is, what is the family situation? Is the child uh, experiencing especially any kind of conflict, constant conflict between you and your spouse if you're living together because children are absorbers of conflict between parents and anxiety. You, if you have high levels of anxiety or depression as a parent, even need, however much you try to hide from your children, it will get them. It will still get them for some reason. They absorb your own anxiety and depression, okay? So how are you? Do you come across as confident yourself, okay? So that's very important. Number three, uh, do you, appreciate the minimum effort that they take okay so that's very very important do you you know give minimum even this it's like when they try so a child had 250 marks today they have 252 marks do you communicate confidence to them do you tell do you appreciate their do you appreciate that minimum effort okay so you, what you want to do is to give them to give them activities that they already can do you know and when they do it, you really celebrate them. You really compliment them, compliment them, okay? So, so uh, when they do a certain activity, we call that positive reinforcement, okay? Positive reinforcement. Give, uh, you know, uh, award them for something. When they do something good, say it by words, say it by gifts, okay? And then slowly they will become more and more confident in themselves, okay? So they need that. That's why I told you, children develop self-concept, you know? When they realize one significant person values them deeply, 
okay? And we said self-concept is about how I think and how I feel. And the question of confidence is around that, okay? So communicate, communicate to them, but also deal with your own internal lows, low levels of confidence because your child, your child will absorb it, huh? will take from you, okay? Uh, this, I think, again, is a question for school. This is to all, especially parents with respect to issues raised on stress for children. What can we do to, uh, could you finish your question? Okay, should these kids be punished during learning? Uh, I'm, I'm, Mama Kailin, did you, did you mean uh, the children with, I was mentioning with autism? Okay, I'm not very certain. But I mean, that's what you might say for not finishing homework or making noise in class or when I'm, when I'm helping them do their homework, okay? I'm not certain if that question is to me. If it is, let me know what you meant precisely. Uh, okay, the question goes to address the stress introduced by having the little ones on masks and social distancing, okay? Okay, so I, what you're asking is, so uh, let me come back to the previous part. This, this is to all the special parents with respect to the issues raised on stress for children. What can we do to address the stress introduced by having the little ones on masks and issues like social distancing? Well, discourage whole socializing in children and useful for their development. So see, one, one of the things that you know, helps really children is when they interact with their colleagues, especially in school. And of course, masks are necessary. And, uh, but when they are able to play together, and sometimes they will pull down these masks, you know, because they want to play, they want to talk, and they don't have the thinking like adults who continually think about the long-term consequence of having a disease. They don't have the software to think about that. Sometimes they pull it down, don't shout at them. They don't know precisely what they are doing, okay? You could as well be shouting at your, you know, at your pet for doing that. They really don't know about the long-term, you know, effects of why they are being punished for not having a mask, okay? So uh, you just keep reminding them, you know, slowly. But them playing together, that they're playing together in, in, in close quarters as far as it is possible, really that is really, really helpful. But remember at the end of the day, a child needs adult support. A child needs adult support. I'm gonna be speaking to you in, the, you know, in, a, in a few moments on attachment parenting and, and how that helps, okay? So uh, if a child has mild autism, can they cope in a normal school or should be taken to a special school? Generally, they can. Generally, they can uh, cope in a, in, a, in, a, in a normal school if the teachers, you know, they have been told, they have uh, been explained to what is happening. So they are more or less patient. But you need to see whether the child is comfortable there. Okay. Is the child comfortable there? You want to have that conversation. How was your day? If you detect too high levels of anxiety and stress, and maybe it's good that you take your child to a clinical psychologist. So the child, the, 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 the clinical psychologist can tell you whether the child is really coping well. So it's a decision I would advise that you take between, you know, you as a parent, among you as a parent, the, the school itself and a clinical psychologist. So that there should be that, okay? So that you make a very, very informed choice. Just like the way you have a family doctor, a doctor that you see for your child, yeah, it's also very important that you do that. Okay, so let me go on a, a little bit and then I'll come back to the questions. Okay, so during this stage of early childhood, children are either developing initiative or guilt, initiative or guilt. So what that means is they're trying to take initiative, they're trying to explore, huh? and they are building this upon the trust if they have developed trust on their parents. So between the ages of zero to two, children are learning to trust their parents. And this trust is that I can be safe, that my mom or dad is a safe place or is a safe person. Yeah? And uh, in a, and into a desire to take initiative or think of ideas and initiate action. So, so if, you're, if you're a three, four, five year old child takes initiative, okay? They take initiative and they, they make a mistake. They make a mistake. I want to take an, so maybe your four year old thinks they can wash dishes. Uh, and they go to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the tap, they go to the sink and they try to wash the dishes. And maybe they break something or there was a knife nearby. And you as a parent or your house help comes in very, very angry. What are you thinking? These children are trying to learn to explore the world. They are trying to take initiative. So as a caregiver, Whatever you focus on when your child is trying to take initiative is going to depend whether your child is going to develop initiative in the future or guilt. 
okay? If you shout down a child who was simply trying to do dishes because they're trying to explore their world to think what they can do, if you simply shout at them without explaining, hey, when you, I, I, I'm very happy that you want to wash the dishes, but when you see this knife here, don't wash it until I put it away, okay? Or until auntie puts it away, or whoever it is puts it away. Because then you are telling them it's okay to take initiative. But then you are helping you as a parent, as the adult, you're trying to moderate the environment that they don't harm themselves, okay? So it's very, very important. Some children can't take initiative because they've been shouted down so much so that they don't know how to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. So parental guidance should help the child move towards the right actions, okay? So you don't want them to take very bad uh, initiative, of course, but when they do, be happy that they are doing it. And when you shout at them or you punish them in any manner, then they feel guilty and maybe they'll be less and less confident because, well, last time I wanted to do something and I got punished for it. Maybe it's there for trying, being, taking initiative is a, is a bad thing. So I will not, I'm not gonna do it, okay? So the goal therefore is to find a balance between initiative and guilt because guilt is, in, is good. Guilt prevents people from behaving badly. Guilt is, is something that you should feel when you do something wrong, obviously. If you, know, if, you, if, you are not, if you don't have guilt, that is what we call a psychopath in psychology. Psychopaths do not have guilt. They can harm people without guilt. It's a classic example of what a psychopath is, okay? So it's not a free for all where the parent allows the child to do anything that they want, okay? So it's a balance between initiative and guilt, okay? So that they don't also hurt themselves, okay? So that's very, very important. All right, so now we go to now towards now self-control and early childhood self-control and early childhood. There is this psychologist called Walter Mitchell and his team, and they realized this is very, very important, that over the years, they have found that the ability to delay gratification at the age of four years predicted better academic performance and health later in life. Okay, so these are serious researches. Now, how did they do this? They gave children two marshmallows. In some instance, I think it's one or two marshmallows. And they said, okay, look, um, if you wait until I come back, I will give you more marshmallows, okay? I'll give you more marshmallows. And uh, what that meant is the child, the children who waited, the children who waited, uh, they, they were shown to have higher levels of self-control and these children who waited did well across lifespan and across many other areas. Um, Sister Wilma, I don't know how much time I have, I go on, okay, all right, uh-huh, okay. It's only I can see you on the, I thought you were preparing to speak. Okay, so, um, and, and, and that's very, very important. Does your child have self-control? Are they able to regulate the emotions? So there are three levels of self-control here. So it's not a single phenomenon. It means, does your child, what you call response initiation, the ability to not initiate a behavior before you have abolited all the information, basically to think before they act, okay? Does, does, a, does a child know how to, you know, to not start a behavior before they have thought a little bit about the consequences. Number two, do they have the ability to stop a behavior that has already begun? Okay, can they stop and say, no, this is not a good idea. It's not a good thing. And the most known self-control is delayed gratification. To hold out for a larger reward by foregoing an immediate smaller reward. And sometimes I tell even parents to try this, you know, tell your child, look, okay, I'm gonna give you two sweets, okay? And I'm gonna leave it on these two sweets on your bed, all right? If in the morning I find I still find the two sweets, I'm gonna give you two more sweets. Okay. Now the child has to stay and even sleep with some sweets next to the child, and that's a very good predictor on how your child, around four years, is doing in terms of self-discipline, how much they're able to, you know, regulate their emotions. Okay, so. And help, help the, help, helping your child to regulate the emotions is very, very useful, long-term, long-term, okay? Now, uh, here I just want to mention on sexuality, of course, sexuality in early childhood is different from adults, okay? And so uh, their responses is not similar to, to, to adults and should not be confused as such. Huh? So um, sexuality begins in childhood as a response to physical states. Now, one of the things that we forget is that boys and girls are capable of erections and vaginal lubrication even before birth. 
you know, many of us have been told that the vaginal lubrication or erection starts at adolescence. No, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. It starts very, very early, very mild erections, very mild vaginal lubrication, okay? But it has nothing to do with orgasm, okay? Uh, and they, sometimes they stimulate those areas for comfort or sometimes to relieve tension, okay? They might stimulate, they might touch their private parts, okay? Uh, and uh, this this erection and this lubrication is is uh, is as I mentioned to you is more related with uh, biological processes than uh, uh, sexual attraction. Okay, so that's important to that's very very important to understand. Yeah? So when you see your 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 boy touching you know your three year old touching his his penis, it's nothing to do with uh, masturbation or anything. It's simply they are. They, they, they use that for comfort at times, okay? Of course, you don't want to encourage that, okay? So self-stimulation and curiosity about body is a natural part of their early childhood. And as a child grows, they're more likely to show their genitals to siblings or peers and masturbation is common, okay? And so you don't want to encourage it, but you don't want to shout them down to, into guilt, okay? You don't want to encourage, you don't want to show them that, you know, it's okay for you to do that. But at the same time, you don't want to uh, make the child feel like okay, I'm the child of a devil by touching those areas. And the more you, the more the, you know, the more the fruit is forbidden, the more the more curious it becomes. The more the fruit is forbidden, the more we want to eat it and find out okay, what is happening here? Okay. So, but it's important therefore for as a primary caregiver, as a parent, to take the time to talk with your children about when it's appropriate for other people to see or touch them, and when it's not. Like mom can touch you when they are washing you, the doctor can touch you, but not anybody else. And that's why they even have a song where they, they, they sing, these are my private parts, you know, they're touching their chest, you know, the, the front area, the buttocks, uh, and that is to show them, these are my private parts, private parts, private parts. That song is helped, is very, very important because we live in an age where sexual abuse is, is very, 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 very high. So we want to, we want to keep it, we want to ensure that, you know, children are not getting hurt. All right, now we go to finally this part, and uh, I just want to mention here that children learn at a young age that there are distinct expectations for boys and girls, okay, and that are culturally appropriate. Now, unfortunately, we live in a time and age where this is increasing and increasing. These genders are increasing without any psychological science basis. I can tell you now there are, there are more than 130 genders, okay? People identifying 130 genders now at night with zero psychological science basis, okay? And sometimes this language can become, is confusing very, 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 very many teenagers. Okay. So gender stereotyping though, should not also be encouraged where oh, boys should not go to the kitchen or girls should not, you know, we need to strike a good balance within the times that we are living in, okay? Uh, so that we don't overgeneralize, okay? But we need to understand that boys and girls are different and those differences are biological and socially grounded. So proper modeling and clear messages can help boys and girls understand their and accept their gender identity. Now, sometimes what happens is, you see, you have 46, chrom you have 23 chromosomes, okay? In pairs, which means 46. Uh, the, the 23rd pair, uh, is the one that determines the gender of a boy. So uh, the X, X, Y means boy, uh, no, girl, if I'm not, if I'm remembering my science properly and Y, Y means, 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 a, means a girl. Uh, sometimes, sometimes these pairs tend to end up having maybe an extra chromosome at times, an extra chromosome at times. So let's take, for example, on the 20, 21st pair, you, there are two chromosomes. Sometimes there's a third pair. When there's a third pair, what do we know? What do we have that? We have that uh, the developmental disorder called Down syndrome. Okay. Now, what happens when there's a, a next a third a third chromosome on the twenty third pair? Okay. So you might find a boy. So a boy is supposed to be uh, X and Y, X and Y. Now, what if there's an extra X? Okay. So you find a boy who is a boy, yes, but it's very very girly. Okay. It's called Kleinfeld syndrome. Okay. And sometimes also that can happen to uh, to girls. Okay, so you have Y, Y, and X, and, and, and then an X. So you'll find a girl who is very, very tomboyish, as we say, very, very boyish. Okay, so to understand that and not to make them feel excluded is also to understand that some those things do happen. Okay, so now, what is your role now as a parent as I go now towards my the conclusion? 
So there's this uh, psychologist who said that family, the parents have five functions towards their children, or it, the family has five functions towards the members. The one is the basic food, water, clothing, and shelter. Number two is encouraging learning. So is your, are your children, feel, do they feel encouraged to learn or do they feel punished if they don't learn, okay? Because those are two different things. Hmm? Two, how do they, you know, family function is to help children develop self-worth and self-confidence from feedback from parents. Do they hear that from you? Okay, uh, it's a place where children learn how to, to nurture friendship with peers because they will be told, they, you know, your parent, as parents, you're supposed to say, okay, when you're choosing a friend, what do you choose? What do you look for? Why? Okay. Do you have those qualities yourself? Do the family, do the friends you are, you are interacting with have those kind of uh, qualities? Okay. It's, it's good that you have a friend who is also kind to other people, not just kind to you, but also kind to other people. Okay. And then providing harmony and stability. So we know very well that dysfunctional families results to stress, high levels of stress in children. All right. So. And this way, I just want to mention that uh, during middle, middle childhood, from the age of uh, six years, children spend lifetime with their parents. And uh, this is what happens. These are what you call adverse childhood experiences. What are the adverse childhood experiences? These are the ones, physical abuse, physical neglect, household member who suffered from mental health issues, sexual abuse, loss of a parent due to death or divorce or separation or abandonment, Emotional abuse, emotional neglect. Uh -huh. So their they, they, they emotions are not taken care of, okay? Household member addicted to illegal drugs and or alcohol. Household member who was imprisoned, witnessing domestic violence, especially against the mother. So this we call adverse childhood experiences. And adverse childhood experiences, okay, have been linked to risky health behaviors, okay? So children who have at least four of these, can be the ones who are very, very abusive in school, okay? They can be very, very aggressive in school and uh, other aggressive behaviors like alcohol abuse and all that. Uh, and chronic health conditions, they get very sick often and it's even been related to some types of cancer, some types of uh, lung diseases. Low life potential, they don't, uh, they, they don't do very well academically, generally speaking. <clears throat> uh, and they don't, overall in life, they, they are not high performers and they die early, they die very, very early. So uh, the Center for Disease Control have found that these traumatic experiences are root cause for many social emotional issues mm, and uh, self-destructive behaviors, violence, chronic health issues, low life potential and premature death. And so what we are saying is the more children experience adverse childhood, the more the people get up a barabara. Okay, because the children who are growing in these places uh, tend to be more violent, tend to be very aggressive. You know? uh, so that's very, very essential to understand. Is your child going through any of these, right? And maybe you don't even know, right? So important to understand. So, so high levels of stress reduces memory. I don't want to like, all this is, of course, the science behind it, that, but children who produce high stress hormone, the cortisol, we all produce cortisol when we are stressed. And the higher it is, the more sicker we get. So people who with high mental illness, that means they get also sick often, okay? They have high blood, uh, you, uh, they have blood problems, they have heart problems, okay? And for children, it affects memory. They don't remember things. And that means the academic performance is going to be low, okay? And also they get flu very often. So you'll find a child constantly, they, they are having a rash, you know, skin rash. They are constantly complaining to you about a stomach ache that you go to the hospital and the, pro, the doctor says this is nothing, okay? Stomach ache, that's a very good sign that child is going through uh, stress and anxiety, uh, diarrhea, okay? Headaches, uh, uh, they, get, they get very sad or they cry more in the evening. In the evening, they just are very, very sad. And especially as the night goes in, they become very sad and they cry more. Again, that's a very good sign that your child is going through stress and anxiety, okay? For six months, they had not urinated on their bed. Huh? They had not had bed wet for six months. And then suddenly they have started bed wetting. Ah, very, very good sign of that, okay? So children can bed wet all the way to five years, but usually ab above seven years is related to stress, okay? So you want also to pay attention to that, okay? Uh, all these signs and symptoms. So the brain 
uh, which has been exposed to stress can be hypersensitive to stress in the future. Okay, and this is what I was just mentioning to you that children with all these ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, they have health risks of alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, suicidal attempts, increase in smoking, not later life, poor health and STDs and physical inactivities and severe obesity. And there's a relationship between adverse childhood experiences with adult diseases such as heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, skeletal fractures and liver disease, and even worsening of uh, the existing allergies like asthma. So the, child, the asthma becomes worse and worse. Okay, so that is, that is risky. So how do we now go towards final, you know, how do we parent as we go now towards the end, okay? So um, Sister Maria Vilma, please let me know if I, if I go beyond time. Ah, yeah. Now, um, I just want to mention this. There are four kinds of parenting. This is called attachment parenting. Very, very useful within psychology, very well supported. And basically this is what it says. There are four kinds of attachment. Secure attachment, avoidant attachment, Ambivalent attachment to action, anxious attachment. Please, if you if you forget anything else, please remember only this one. Huh? And disorganized attachment. Now, what what that means is there were there was a psychologist called Mary Ensworth, and what she did is just just to explain briefly, what she did is she took uh, uh, young children below two years, uh, two to three years, and uh, she put them with the mother in a room. Okay, and so the mother will be the child. The child will be playing her, huh? and then the mother and then the mother would leave. Okay, uh, sorry, we just as, as in as they, as they in the room, a stranger would come in and sit next to the mother. The child will continue playing. When the mother leaves, that is where the psychologist wanted to see the behavior of the child because it will show the quality of the relationship. If the child started crying immediately, then they would say, okay, that means there's a certain kind of attachment. But what happens when the child comes, when the, what happens when the, when the mother comes back in and picks up the child? If the mother picks up the child and the child stops crying shortly after, that's a very good thing. Because that means the child is comfortable in the eyes of their caregiver. They feel comfortable, they feel consoled. But if the child continues crying, even after the mother picks her up, there is a problem. That means the child does not trust the mother. The child does not learn to be secure in the arms of the mother. Okay? And that's what we call either secure attachment or insecure. And if, if, if the mother leaves, or the, whoever is the primary caregiver, if the primary caregiver leaves the room with a stranger that the child doesn't know, and the child does not care, uh, again, the good, the bad sign. Huh? That means there's no bond between the mother and child. Okay, so now let's say explore that. Let's explore that. So the secure attachment is not the first one. There's a distress when the primary caregiver leaves the room. The child leaves, you know. And uh, if the stranger who is in the room was to, if the stranger was to try to be friendly to the child, uh, the, the child, you know, the child will avoid the stranger, okay? The child would avoid the stranger, okay? Now, uh, it, but it's also very happy and positive uh, when the primary caregiver returns, with the mother or whoever, or the father, whoever is there, okay? And we'll use primary caregiver as a safe space to explore, safe base, okay? So the infant believes and trusts that their needs will be met, okay? So how is a parent to ensure this kind of attachment that you are sensitive and consistent to the physical and emotional needs of the child, okay? So parents who are consistent when the child cries, you know, especially below the two years, as I told you, they respond and the attachment, the, the attachment grows. Now, what, what, what about avoidant, or what you call insecure, avoidant attachment? The infant shows no signs of distress when the primary caregiver leaves. The mother leaves the child, and the child is, oh, infant is okay with the stranger and might even play normally when the stranger is present, doesn't care, really. Huh? So infant shows little interest when the primary caregiver returns. You know? So primary caregiver and stranger are able to, pray, to provide comfort equally well, okay? Why? Because the infant believes that their needs probably won't be met. And what has made the infant, what has made the infant to, to respond like this? The infant, you know, has found that in the past, even when the infant cries or when they have needs, those needs are not met. So there's no point of crying. There's no point of hoping that you will help. So it could as well be a stranger around me. Okay. Then there's what we call insecure attachment. Okay. 
ambivalent, okay, which is called uh, uh, anxious, okay. So here, the child cries when the primary caregiver gives the mother or father, whoever is it, and the child will avoid the stranger, okay, and shows fear. And when the caregiver returns, you know, uh, they are, uh, approaches the mother, but resist contact. May, they may push them away. So you might find a child who has been lifted by the mother or by the, by the father, and then they are, they are leaning back as if they want to fall away from the arms. Okay, they are pushing even from the chest. That means there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a problem between the parents and the child. Okay, they're even pushing away. Okay, so, so the cries and need explores less and cannot rely on their needs being met. Okay, so what that means is the parent, the parent, Sometimes, sometimes responds to the child, sometimes does not. Sometimes responds, sometimes does not. And so what that, what that means is the child does not know, will my mom, will my needs be met now? So the child is constantly anxious. And the last one is disorganized. So this is when the parents are maybe just purely neglectful. And so the child looks just frozen. You know, those children who look they, they're just frozen, they, like they don't know what's happening to them. They're just there. Right, even maybe teachers, you can pay attention to these. Maybe a child who is all, all almost just dazed or oh, frozen. You know, they may not, they may or may not seek comfort or help from a stranger. They just don't know. Okay, um, they may move away and may uh, and back into primary care give for comfort. So there is contradictory approaches. Moves away and moves back and may move back into primary care giver. So, and then freezes, goes into stillness, rocks, fears the primary care giver. Infant confuses conflicting impulses of not knowing how to get their needs met, okay? So they look frightened, okay? And maybe the parents also frightens the child by shouting or by, um, uh, by punishing, punishing them for something that they have not done or they don't know what to do, okay? So when, when children have been securely attached, they have a positive view of themselves. I'm not going to read everything. When those who, are, who have high levels of anxious attachment have very negative view of themselves, but a very positive view of others. See this, when children are properly attached to their parents, they have a positive view of themselves, but also a positive view of others. But when they have negative or anxious attachment, they have negative view of themselves, but positive view of others, okay? And sometimes we might think of them that they are very nice people. No, not necessarily. When they have avoidant attachment, they have very positive view of self and very negative view of others. You see that? So you find these children are now the bullies because bullies, bullies don't have low self-esteem as many of us have been taught. They have exaggerated self-esteem. Huh? And they think very low of others. And oftentimes it, come, it comes down to the type of attachment they have had. Yeah? And this also affects relationships as you can see at the very bottom this when they go into now romantic relationship the securely attached person is you know he is there for me when i need him she's always she always calms me okay those with anxious attachment you know they are in a constant fear of losing the relationship okay they can be very aggressive they can be clingy when the when the relationship ends okay and they are always thinking she will let me down he's going to leave me Okay, and as you can see, avoidant attachment, they avoid the relationships also. I don't need someone in my life. I can take care of myself, okay? And sometimes we confuse these people who are poorly attached to their parents when young. We, we tend to think of them as very, very independent. Yes, but they don't know how to be in a relationship, basically. And the last one is they have a negative view of themselves and a lot of others. And, you know, they are very fearful of making connections with other people. They just... Just, just feel that it won't work, and they can be self-harming. And they, you know, they are they seek closeness and at the same time avoid it. Okay, no one can love me. There's something wrong with me. You know, I am unlovable. Where does it start? All the way to the attachment kind they had with their parents. So, just a summary of what I've mentioned here. Therefore, is people who are secure, children who are securely attached. You know, they have low trust in themselves and high trust in others. Those who are secure have trust in themselves and high trust in others, which is a good thing. And those who are disorganized, they have low trust in others and low trust in self, but avoid them. And many children are here, many adults are here. And we tend to praise them for being very independent. And I'm saying it's not a very healthy thing. 
They have very low trust in others, but high trust in themselves. Okay. So what happens when you are good, when you, when you follow now this uh, attachment parenting based on scientific research? So the child is more sensitive and giving, okay? Sensitive means to other people's needs and more kind and generous. They have higher IQ than others. They are healthier, okay? They are better behaved. They have higher self-esteem and they are less stressed, okay? So now let me see the questions and then I'm gonna finish that. And in case I take time, please let me know. Um, uh, so let's see this just quickly. Yes, X, X girl, X, Y boy. Yes, yes, certainly. X, Y, thank you for that. I had said Y, Y for sure, wrong. Okay, just, I'm, just, I'm just going to respond to the questions that I can within the time that I'm given. Um, Maureen asks, any comment on age of mother contributing to autism by any chance? Um, I'm not very sure if it is the age of the mother or it's the age of the father. There is, there is a, there is a chance, I'm, I'm forgetting which particular, I'm forgetting whether it's Down syndrome, huh? uh, that is, as the mother ages, the chances of uh, Down syndrome increases as the ovaries uh, and, the, and the ovum age. But also autism, I think is more related to the age of the father, okay? And Maureen, if, I, if I'm getting my science correct. So as the father ages, the, the, the chances of having autism increases because also the sperm, the quality of the sperms uh, decreases, okay? And so uh, having children later in life does not mean every you know, child will have that, but I'm saying it, it is more related also to the age, of, uh, the age of the father. Okay, so the chances of having an autistic child can increase uh, as, the child, as the father grows you know, way above 40, but it can be strongly mitigated or reduced if the child, if the father has a healthy lifestyle, okay? All right, okay. Um, so I'm trying to go back to the very, to the question that I can get and please, um, all right, so I got it, I got it. Yes, bullying is, a, is an issue that we need to be careful of, but remember the most important thing is to teach your child to learn to how to stand up for themselves. Bullying, bullies like to, take advantage of children who, who are overprotected. We know that the most bullied children come from overprotected families. So children who are overprotected tend to get bullied, okay? So being an overprotective mother, being an overprotective father is not a good thing long-term because the child does not know how to stand up for themselves. So one of the ways to mitigate, of course, is the school to ensure that the bullies know that they will be caught and they will be punished. That's very, very important. Okay, that's very, very important. But the second most important thing is to teach your child to stand up for themselves. It's very, very important. Not to fight back, but to stand up for themselves, okay? So assertive communication, this is very, very important, okay? So children who, uh, are not, who, who don't know if, if their mother is going to be or their father is going to stand up for them, uh, they usually don't know how to react, you know, or whether they can turn to the teacher for help, okay? So it's very, very important. Um, how can you teach our kids? So I'm going to give very brief answers because my time is up. How can we teach our kids to be kind to kids with special needs? Okay, so that's something that can uh, the children can 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 learn to see. They need for they they need to hear from the parents. Okay, so this is one of the things that um, I have done with my niece and nephew. Uh, when we, they used to we used to keep a um, kindness journal. So every time I meet them, I would not ask them whether they have been nice to their friends, I, t I usually tell them, tell me someone you don't like in school and tell me how you have helped them, okay? So, and then I'll tell you, I want you tomorrow, next week, I want you to be kind to someone you don't like. And I want you to tell me about it when you come back home, okay? So that seems to be a good thing, you know, because they are, they are learning that I should not just be kind to people who are like me, okay? So, what I'm saying is, it's also important to you as a parent to be able to ask your child, okay, uh, is there someone who is special with disability, you know, with a, you know, who has a disabilities in school, okay? Have you been kind to them? Can you take this and, uh, and, and give it to them, okay? I want you to take something from one of your things and take to them, okay? Uh, and then see what they select from among their toys. I want you to select some of the things that I bought for you and give to that friend with disabilities and see what they give. Okay, all right, so that is important so as you can see how kind they are. 
At what age do you notice autism? They, as I mentioned, is uh, the average age is three years, three, three, three and a half years. Thank you, Dominic. Are these sleep hours continuous or can it be broken down into three hours in the morning and the remaining hours at a different time? So the thing is, you, you usually sleep in four stages, usually sleep in four stages. So the, usually the best thing is as much as you can have continuous sleep, okay? It's continuous sleep. It's very, very important. You can have siesta during the day, but it's usually the best, the best situation is when you are able to sleep those five, those, the hours that are required continuously. If you can sleep continuously, that's that already that's a good point. Maybe your levels of depression are high. If we had time, maybe I could test your levels of depression. And but we don't have time for that. But what you want to see is if actually you're struggling to sustain sleep for you know continuously, then pay attention to that. You know, pay attention to that. And one of the biggest culprits is alcohol. Too much alcohol, you know, it really disrupts quality sleep. Okay. Um, how do I make my child be free to talk with me? Time, 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 time. You don't push your child to speak to you. You spend time with your child, okay? And here I would like to speak to the mothers. Now, if you are having high levels of stress and anxiety when you are pregnant, there is lower chance you will develop a very good relationship with your child. The child might have very avoidant behavior towards you. Huh? So, but you can spend time with them. As you spend time with them, play with them, you know, uh, because then over time they become now comfortable with you. So you can't pull information from your child if you have not taken time just to simply waste time with them. As Pope Francis says, parents, waste time with your children. Waste time. Okay, that's essential. That's what I would say the same. So the more you waste time together, the more the child becomes more and more comfortable with you. The more the child hears positive words from you, the more the child will be able to be vulnerable with you, okay? How do teachers decide on sitting? Okay, I think that's a school question. Menu, any comments? Okay, uh -huh. Sister Wilma. Now, with, not with autism or normal kids, as in, should we use Kiboko? <laughs> Uh, for me, I tend to think, uh, in my opinion, and as a psychologist, I think kiboko should be used as a last resort, okay? Because oftentimes when you're using physical punishment, it means you, have, you are losing authority on your child, and that's why you, are, you need to resort to physical, physical punishment. The child should know, my mom will beat me, my dad will beat me if I, don't, if I don't behave properly. But before that, there are many other ways. There are many other kinds of, kinds of punishment. Yeah, maybe something that I like is taken away. So maybe not this privilege, this privilege is taken away, or you do have maybe constructive punishment, you do house chores, okay? Or you do a, a variety of others. So if you don't do that, then the kiboko will come in. It is there, it is on the table, okay? But the child knows as the last, you know, the last uh, is the last resort. Because what happens is when you, when you, it is very clear today in psychology that the more you punish children, the more they become insensitive to it. Okay, they become insensitive to it. So, ah, or you are the mother who wanna pick a tuma kele lakini ufanye kitu. So especially children, they become teenagers, they will know, ah, mama angu atapiga tuma kele hakuna kitu wafanya. Hakuna kitu wafanya. Kesho tunarudia hiyo, hiyo tu. And then maybe some mothers even take the authority from themselves and tell the child, babako wakija ni tamuambia. So the mother, child knows, mama ata hakuna, hakuna kazi. And then sometimes they also develop fear for the father. That's not a good thing. Why do you want them not to like their father, to always view their father as the punisher, you know? Be, be together. So my child witness does going through separation and she pretends not to be affected, but I can see, I can see she's, how can I help? Okay, so you might want to broach the, the, the topic, okay? So you might want to broach the topic, okay? Say it, talk it out, speak it out, all right? With the child and uh, do, you, do you miss your mom? Do you miss your dad? Okay, um, uh, do you know what happened, okay? And if you feel you don't know how to do this as a parent, then book a session. You know, you can write to me on my email. I will, I will connect you to a, a counselor and then the counselor can be a mediator. Right? That's what we call an intervention. You can be a mediator to help you speak to your child. And it's very, very important. Don't ignore it. Sit with the counselor. It's just maybe one hour, one hour and a half. It's gonna cost you maybe around 2,000 two or 3,000 shillings. Speak with the counselor. Let the child, let the counselor maybe mediate the conversation. 
and help you to understand uh, how the child is being affected by the separation, okay? But the most important thing is relationship, relationship, relationship between you and your child, relationship between your child. Spend time with your child. Let them feel, in, in spite of the fact that there's separation, I'm always, I'm, I'm always gonna be there for them. And if there's a new parent, yes, you need, you need really to, to ensure that they are okay with that. Okay, I'm answering very, very briefly. It may not be very direct, but how do I help with pre any preschoolers who constantly fight each other whenever they are together? Okay, so I would suggest an intervention here. You can always uh, bring in parents. You know, this, your kids are constantly fighting. So you can inform the parents. I, I don't think education should be only be left to teachers. That will not, will not work by any stretch of the imagination. You have to, parents have to work together with the teachers. Uh, and teachers have also to consult with parents. So it's a two-way traffic as far as I can tell. And also to find out why they are constantly abusive like this. Okay, why, why, why are they constantly fighting is also very, very important. Like sit down and ask. Okay, and then maybe uh, start pushing them to now do good things to each other and report to you. Have you done something positive today to that friend you fought yesterday? What did you do? Okay, then it should report to you. And then, over time, they can overcome that. Someone asked, my four-year-old is hyperactive and most times he won't hear what you tell him to do until you threaten to beat him. How can I go about this? Um, first of all, yeah, he's a boy, four-year-old. Okay. Um, I would suggest that you see. <laughs> so I don't know if you have ever heard about um, ADHD, I, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity, Hyperactivity Disorder. It affects uh, boys more than girls. So they're very, very hyperactive. They speak out of turn. They can't concentrate on a task. They are very, they are playful. They can't, you know, they can't focus. So it's it's very, it's quite common increasingly among boys. And I say it's also common among ad adults. Eh? And uh, when you when you describe your child like this, I am I am tempted to think it is ADHD. And ADHD is biological. Huh? Uh, so I would suggest to you, I'll not mention your name because you have said you sent a direct message. I'll suggest to you, you, either you can get in touch with me, I introduce you to uh, a psychologist to see whether your child has hyperactivity disorder or, or, or why they are quite hyperactive as so the way you are, the way you are, the way you are saying this, okay? But at the same time, you can, you can start by, by inquiring, requiring that your child has periods of quiet, periods of quiet, and then reward those quiet moments. You see, the problem is, when your child is hyperactive or does something that you don't like, we punish them. But usually we don't do the opposite. When a child does what we want, what do we say? Aya, come on, as a fikiria. You know, that is us not being positive to our children. Okay? That's not helpful. So let the child aim for being more quiet, as you if you're seeing the hyperactivity is too high. So what you can do is start rewarding moments of concentration, those moments when they are focused, those moments when they are quiet, as you'd like, then reward that. So the child knows, okay, oh, so being, so being quiet is a good thing. So being uh, calm is a good thing, right? Because they need to hear it from you. So if you're only punishing them or they only see your attention when, you, they, when they are doing wrong, why, why should they do good? Okay. So reward the positive. Okay, going on quickly, that is fees. Um, I don't know, this, this question of homework. So I think that is also schools. How about sharing bathroom for boys and girls? Is it okay? I would not recommend it by any stretch of the imagination. I would not recommend it. Uh, okay. Keep this anonymous. Is it normal for a five-year-old to ask to wear a dress like he sees his female and cousins wearing? He has no sister, just as a, just a, a younger brother. Well, it is, it is possible if especially you are a single parent and they are not seeing a male, male model, okay? So they might, you might, you might want them, you might want to, you might want to expose your child to a male model who is good because they, you don't want them getting abused anyway. So I would suggest to you that as much as you can expose your child to a male model, uh, so that they are able to, uh, so they're able to interact properly and know how, because, you know, we live in a time, we, we live in a time during Father's Day, I was very, very sad to see and I'm not, I'm not judging, I'm not judging single mothers. No, I'm not judging. So I'm not condemning them by any threat. But during Father's Day, uh, many single mothers were celebrating and say, you know, I'm the father of my child also. And I'm like, stop playing politics with children. You know, do whatever you want, but 
stop playing politics with children. Children need a male figure. They need, and we know that in psychology, they need. Anyway, so have, have a father figure or a male for your child is very, very important, who, who can model masculinity, healthy masculinity. Okay, uh, I will not be able to share the presentation because these are, this is my teaching um, uh, material. But I'm, I think there is a recording. Uh, the recording will be provided to all of you. Uh, great presentation. Okay, great presentation. Uh, okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, this. Yes, I can share my number. I can see a few of you are asking. That's good. Uh, yes, I do give a. I do give workshops also in a variety of areas, mental health in to organizations and to schools. So yes, you can you can invite me. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the deep knowledge. Any plans for to share the presentation? As I've mentioned that. Okay, uh -huh. wonderful presentation. For a child who isn't willing to share, how do we work on it? First of all, focus on relationship. First of all, focus on relationship. I can't overstate that. So, so it's, it's, just, it's just like in marriage. Uh, <laughs> marriage therapists have found out that couples who spend at least 90 minutes a week, whether it is distributed or together, focusing on their relationship have the lowest levels of conflict and lowest levels of divorce. Okay, so that you as a why mother, you know, husband and wife, you try to distribute for 90 minutes a week, just the, for the two of you, seems to mitigate a lot of problems. So the same thing with spending time with your child. Before you, before you expect anything, just try to have intentional time for bonding with your child, intentional time, intentional time. Hmm? Uh, um, again, I'm moving very, very fast. Uh, wonderful presentation, thank you very much. Uh, how can one hundred child who st started the bedwetting immediately after joining school? Okay, so uh, I would suggest to you that uh, uh, you find bedwetting, as I've mentioned to you, can be as a result of a stressful anxiety like starting school. Okay, so children who maybe parents divorce can start bedwetting, or they move to a new area, they can start bedwetting or they have a new sibling, they can start bedwetting because you know having a sibling is a, a stress and anxiety provoking for the old for the sibling who was there before because now attention is no, no longer to them. So it's, it can be stressful and they can start bedwetting as a, as a, as a, as a consequence. Um, so uh, joining school can also be stress and anxiety provoking and they, they, they can start bedwetting. So reassurances, reassurances, talking about how was your day? Uh, have you made a friend? Uh, you know, have you talked to the teacher because you want to, the child to tell you basically you're comfortable in school. Uh, finishing up quickly now, if you, uh, sister, can I finish? Sister Maria, yes, my time is up. I can see uh, someone. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can see, uh, I, I was not seeing, I was not seeing you. I'm very, very sorry for that. I was trying to answer the questions as fast as I can, but I can tell from your body language I have gone beyond the time I was given. But thank you so much. And I know there are questions there that are still here that have not been uh, responded to. Uh, as I've mentioned to you in the here at the very beginning, please uh, feel free to write to me. I'm just going to leave this one here. Uh, use the personal email, uh, write to me there. Okay, please. Uh, you can take that, uh, a screenshot of that, I mean, a photo of that. Write to me because my time is up. And if there's some, some questions I've not responded, I can respond later. Thank you for your patience, moderators. I'm sorry for again going beyond time and not seeing all the signs that you have been showing to me to finish up. God bless. Take care and bye. Wow. Thank you very much, Mr. Dominic. We kindly request you to stay on. Dear parents, that's it. That's the talk we had today. Before we respond to your questions, kindly allow me to appreciate the speaker of the day. Mr. Dominic, that was very informative, very educative, and I am sure for our dear parents in daycare, PP1 and PP2, they have learned a lot. No wonder they had so many questions, meaning they were good learners. They were able to ask, and that is how learning should take place. Ask questions where you need to be given some clarification. Once again, 
Mr. Dominic, kudos to you. That was very good. That was very great. And as I've also realized at this age, these children really need us more. It is not the time to say that you are so busy looking for money. Yes, you need to do that. But imagine they are also growing. They need you also. Be there for them. They can't grow without you. We have just learned that even as they grow, they are also watching us. What are we showing them? Thank you, Mr. Dominic. Information is power. Let us walk with these children. We really need, need a lot of time to be with them. Thank you very much, Mr. Dominic.